All right. <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction. Um, so this is work that I've been doing with my advisors, David Battisti and Cecilia Bitts at the University of Washington. Um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, geoengineering with stratospheric aerosols, in particular uh, looking at um, whether or not severe consequences to climate change can be avoided. Okay, so uh, why would we geoengineer? Well, to first order, ge the purpose of geoengineering is to cancel uh, global mean temperature rise that would occur under anthropogenic increased anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Um, but in reality, uh, we would really want to geoengineer to avoid severe consequences to this temperature rise. Yeah. If there were no uh, severe consequences, we may not be talking about global warming so much. Um, so some of the severe consequences um, that I'm going to talk about are, oops, Uh, Arctic warming um, and sea ice loss, and this is threatening to ice-dependent animals and ecosystems, uh, permafrost melt, and uh, in the other side of the globe, uh, Antarctic surface warming and ocean warming can um, have implications for ice shelf and, and ice sheet melt, and this uh, would lead to sea level rise. And I'm focusing on the poles because the poles are the most sensitive part of the globe in terms of climate change, and especially in the Arctic, it's uh, projected to warm more than the global mean. Um, there are other severe consequences that I could mention, like uh, warming of the tropics that would lead to food security uh, problems, but I'm, I'm really just going to um, talk about the poles today. So to do this, I ran a global climate model. I ran NCAR's CCSM3. Um, and to simulate stratospheric sulfate aerosols, um, I just prescribed a, uh, a burden of sulfate. And this data I got from a study from Rash et al. in 2008 in the simulation that they ran um, where they uh, injected sulfur dioxide and, and let it interact with the stratosphere. So I'm prescribing this burden, burden of uh, sulfate, and the CCSM3 treats it as volcanic aerosol. And here, here's, what the, uh, here's what the layer looks like. <clears throat> this is latitude by pressure, and you can see this little maximum of concentration. And <clears throat> that's because that is the injection site in the other simulation that Phil Rash ran. And so the way these sulfates work is that they just reflect shortwave radiation, um, <clears throat> and they let less energy into the atmosphere, uh, cooling the planet. So the simulations that I investigated are here. I'm showing a, a time series of global mean surface temperature. Uh, the solid black line is the modern control with uh, 350 parts per million carbon dioxide. This dashed line here is the pre-industrial control, just for reference. Um, this red line here is the uh, it's NCAR's run where they have in, a ramping of carbon dioxide at 1% per year. And then I ran this geo run here where I ramped the sulfate layer burden um, so that at any given time the, the radiative forcing should be equal and opposite to the radiative forcing of the carbon dioxide. And then when you put them together, the two forcings, what you get is this green line. And uh, so what you can see is that um, in global mean surface temperature is uh, canceled throughout the simulation. So we, we keep the surface temperatures right on the control. But now if we look at precipitation, I'm showing you a time series of global mean precipitation, the same simulations, um, precipitation increases with the increasing CO2, but now if we look at this geo-CO2 run with the two forcings, what you'll notice is that the precipitation is consistently declining. And so this is, this is related to the fact that the forcing that we're prescribing is a short wave effect, and carbon dioxide is a long wave effect, and these two types of forcings uh, affect radiation differently. So uh, now moving into, oh, right, and I should mention that uh, the next figures that I'll be showing you are averages of these, of these time periods. It's the 20, the 20 years surrounding CO2 doubling and the 40 years surrounding CO2 doubling. So just for reference, this is the uh, change in surface temperature at the time of CO2 doubling in the CO2 run, so it's an increase of 1.4 degrees. But now if we compare that to uh, the net run, well, first of all, what you notice is that uh, the color bar is a lot smaller. Most of the surface temperatures are kept pretty close to zero. 
um, with some residual warming in the poles. <clears throat> so uh, to first, first order, this sulfate layer does a pretty good job <clears throat> of canceling surface temperature. But because these forcings are very different, uh, carbon dioxide is well mixed in the, stratos in the troposphere, and the uh, sulfate layer that I'm prescribing has a vertical structure. It's just in the lower stratosphere. <clears throat> so we might expect that the vertical structure of the atmosphere looks different, and, and in fact it does. Um, here is a zonal mean uh, plot of temperature pressure by latitude, and on the right is the change in the uh, increased CO2 case, and as expected, it's a warmer troposphere and a cooler stratosphere. But you'll notice in the GeoCO2 run that uh, there's this residual, uh, or this it's not even a residual, it's actually a, uh, a warming maximum, and that's due to the sulfates themselves, because they do absorb a little bit of radiation. And so this actually, this change in the upper, uh, in the upper atmosphere will, has effects for uh, has implications for the zonal mean um, zonal wind. So here is the, oh, I should say that the colors are the anomalies from the control and the contours are the control. So um, down here, uh, I'm showing you the change in the zonal mean zonal wind, CO2 versus uh, the net run. And so what you'll notice is that, um, if anything, the changes in the CO2 are amplified a little bit. So we have a strengthening of the polar vortex in the northern hemisphere, a slight shift in strengthening in the southern hemisphere. So <clears throat> one of the main uh, points here is that the circulation changes really aren't canceled uh, in terms of you can't cancel uh, increased CO2 circulation changes. <clears throat> and, and these um, stratus, you know, wh what began in the stratosphere has now, it actually manifests itself at the surface. We have um, I'm showing here a change in zonal wind stress. And you can see that these two color bars are now the same scale. And um, they're very comparable. Uh, this is a little bit reduced from the increased CO2 run, but um, still a large fraction of the changes are there. And so these surface wind stress um, changes do have implications for um, the ocean circulation, which has implications for um, some of these emergencies. <clears throat> so. Now I'm drilling down into a seasonal regional look. So I'm showing you uh, winter time. This is the run GeoCO2, which has both of the forcings in it. And I'm showing you the winter because that's when we see the largest um, effects left over. Um, summertime, surface temperatures are canceled very well in the summer hemisphere, if not overcooled. So um, <clears throat> I'll be focusing on the winter here. Um, what you can see is just the broad, a broad warming a residual warming, and I'm pointing out the wet L and the raw seas because um, these are uh, seas which have ice sheets outlet into them. And a quick look at uh, what happens with the sea ice. So here is a uh, change in sea ice concentration. Now the I've got two contours on here. The solid contour is the control, and the dashed contour is um, the GeoCO2 run, and you'll notice that the extent is not changed at all, but in fact there are, there are changes of, in concentration along the edges. And um, this is a ice thickness, change in ice thickness along with wind stress uh, in the winter, and you'll notice that there's definitely an anomalous circulation here. And we've, we've looked at, um, um, this may be teleconnected from surface temperature changes in the tropics, but I'm not going to talk about that today. <clears throat> All right, so um, in order to get a sense for how much the ocean matters, I, I did a set of simulations with a slab ocean also. So I took uh, the same forcings and um, have a slab ocean which has dynamic and thermodynamic sea ice. And so I'm just going to show you one figure from that. We can get a sense for how the answer is different in a slab model. Um, and so. Here is the same figure, except it's in the slab. It's just a change in surface temperature in the winter time. <clears throat> and what you can see is that if I just flip back and forth, it's quite a different pattern. In fact, in the in the fully coupled run, we have a more ex expansive uh, surface warming. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at some ocean variables to see if I can figure out what's going on. <clears throat> So here is some ocean figures. This is a depth by latitude plot. 
um, I'm showing a zonal mean, but only in the Ross Sea, and that's, that's over here. This is what the uh, changes in the increased CO2 run. The colors are the anomalies from the control. The solid contours are the control, and the dashed are the uh, perturbed run, the GeoCO2. So um, just comparing the net, now we have the GeoCO2 run. We've got a color bar that's an order of magnitude smaller. Um, it's definitely cooler. Uh, than the two times CO2 run basically everywhere. So um, in terms of if we just want to broad brush talk about the ice sheets in the Ross Sea or the ice shelves, um, we might say that G this, uh, the sulfates are doing a pretty good job at, at keeping the, sea temp the ocean temperatures cooler. But if we look at the Weddell Sea now, so it's, again, this is just a zonal mean within the Weddell, and that's, this is the Antarctic Peninsula over here, Weddell Sea. Um, what you'll notice in just in the comparison is that um, the, again, the color bars are, are still a lot smaller, but one thing that I want to point out is that we have this bulb of, of warming water that's coming in, and that actually isn't in the two times CO2 run. So this is like maybe one area where we're not helping the situation by uh, uh, putting sulfates in the stratosphere. and. Um, I, I think all the, the reason for all of this is stems back to the wind stress changes that are not canceled at the surface. So you get uh, wind, um, kind of a, a poleward shift in, in the jet. The wind stress changes are a little bit closer to the wet LC. That acts to increase Ekman transport to the north. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, Ekman, excuse me, in, increasing Ekman transport to the north, which causes divergence, and you get some upwelling of um, slightly warmer subsurface waters. So, you know, I have to heavily caveat this because it's been, um, there's been some recent work that suggests that ocean resolution actually has a huge effect on what you, what your results are in, in these types of, of studies. So um, this is something that definitely needs to be done in a higher resolution ocean model. Um, and to put, to put my results in even further context, um, I'm just, for, for, as an example, showing you uh, the standard deviation in the change in surface temperature uh, among the IPCC air farm models when they run the uh, A1B scenario. And the point I want to make is that um, the regions that disagree the most, so the regions with the largest standard deviations, uh, are the regions that I've just talked about. And so um, in order to get a sense for uh, what types, how robust are these results? I think um, people have been suggesting that we need to run g these types of scenarios in many models. And in fact, there's a, there's a paper out by Kravitz and, and Alan Robach um, suggesting that we have something called a GeoMIP. And so I think this, this kind of thing would need to be, I think that's a good idea. So um, just conclusions. The sulfate, <clears throat> excuse me, the sulfate layer does actually reduce the effects of increased CO2. If you just want to talk about, I'm not talking about um, ocean acidification, but in terms of the, the uh, atmospheric climate, um, circulation changes aren't, aren't, uh, cha aren't reduced too much. Um, and so I would say that we can't conclude that the sulfate aerosol injections don't help avoid climate emergencies, but also due to uh, many uncertainties in my study and in geoengineering in this way in general, uh, we can't conclude that severe consequences to climate change won't occur. So, thanks. Do we have time for a couple of questions for Kelly? Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. So, the first one is, do you think the precipitation reduction is due to the high level warming of the sulfate? Due to this? Um, the question is, do I think that the precipitation reduction is due to the warming in the stratosphere? I think it's just more related to, there's like, because it's a shortwave radiation uh, change, it's at the surface energy budget has to balance well, I this. Maybe that's part of it, yeah. Maybe. I don't so, know. Uh, In my in my study, or uh, wh what's the question? So actually, in the practice, I mean, other layers. 
Oh, so yeah, in practice, um, I think that's a whole other other realm of research. Uh, I mean, aircraft could, uh, people have studied aircraft exhaust um, having sulfate in it. And so wherever the aircrafts would go would be the layer, but you know, the Brewer Dobson does transport particles up there, so. It, yeah, I think vertically speaking, yeah, they'll sediment out though, um, you know, kind of in the storm track regions and then the pole. Yeah, I think we're going to have to move on, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Kyle.